Oh, you all are so good. It's like bring up the noise, bring down the... Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Willow Bay, the Dean of USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and I'm really excited to be with you today and kicking off the Child Mind Institute Summit, the State of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. Welcome to all of you here at the Paley Center in New York and to all of you joining us live on Facebook and in the ABC News universe for a vital conversation about brain development and mental wellness, the mental health risks that are facing our kids and teens, and how all of that plays out in our culture. I'd like to thank Dr. Harold Koplowitz and the Child Mind Institute for sponsoring this event and frankly for working every day to help young people and to make mental health, children's mental health, a part of the national conversation. 17.1 million children and adolescents will struggle with a mental health disorder. 50% of these disorders start before the age of 14. 75% before the age of 24. They put our young people at risk for dropping out of school, for bullying, for violence, for risky decisions, jail, and even suicide. But our understanding of the brain and behavior is changing how we help young people with disorders like anxiety and depression, how we nurture and teach young children to prevent these disorders later, and even how we talk about mental health openly to eradicate the stigma that keeps families from seeking care. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear from Secretary Clinton and from Dr. Koplowitz on all of these issues. But right now, I would like to introduce a courageous and talented high school junior, Alex Crotty. She's going to share her mental health challenges with us today. She's amazingly open about her experience with depression and how it affected her family and about how she got help at the Child Mind Institute. So please join me in welcoming Alex to the stage. Thank you. What people don't see is how much treatment for my depression has helped me grow as a person. In middle school, I was very severely depressed. I seldom smiled. I seldom spoke to my peers. I never felt happy. I felt extremely isolated and helpless at my old school. I was bullied very badly. Regularly, I was made fun of for being friendless. People arranged a hate Alex day. I was told I could never belong by people I cared about. Common sense told me something was wrong, but I had internalized the things I was told to the point where I thought that I was pathetic and that I was undeserving of people's love and respect. I told no one of the things I had been through because I didn't expect anyone to believe me. So, I thought in order to be accepted that I had to be special. I tried to stand out by making edgy and controversial jokes and by refusing to conform to any stereotypes of a preteenage girl. I prided myself upon standing out. I believed wholeheartedly that so long as I was doing whatever everyone else wasn't, that that made me superior in a sense. However, this only made me further removed from my companions because in rejecting all social norms, I destroyed any chance I had at gaining compassion through being relatable. My parents told me that I had to be more sociable and to make an effort with my classmates. I tried. I was ignored. I blamed myself, thinking that something must be inherently wrong with me if I couldn't even connect with a single person in my grade. I was only 12 years old, and I found myself questioning whether it was worth it to continue living. Every day, I either felt sad or empty or both. Regardless of what I did, I couldn't seem to get it right. However, I knew that if I gave in, I would be proving those who had scorned me right, and I was far too spiteful and cocky to let them win. <laughs> and so I lived. I didn't speak out about what I had been through until I had already lift, left for my new school. I remember thinking that I could have always had it worse, and that, so I thought that to reach out for help would be seen as complaining. When I told my mom, I said that I couldn't feel anything. She cradled me in her arms and asked, can you feel me? Can you feel my love? In that moment, I realized that I hadn't been alone. She immediately reached out to my doctor who recommended that I see a counselor. I was diagnosed with depression on my first visit to the Child Mind Institute. Ever since then, I've been getting treatment. I've mostly recovered from my illness. 
I know that I am loved. I know that there's a lot more good in the world than bad. And I know that my peers are more than willing to support me in my times of need. This being said, depression is really isolating. The diagnosis didn't change things immediately, and recovery truly was two steps forward, one step back. I wish I could tell you that right now everything is perfect. It's not. There's still a part of me that believes that I'm not good enough. I still relapse sometimes, and I'm still working through and moving past a lot of the things I underwent. However, the hardest part is speaking up, and be it talking to a friend, a family member, or another important person in your life, it's crucial to talk about things with someone you trust, because just those 10 seconds of bravery can truly be life-changing. Thank you. You are beautiful, you are brave, and thank you very much for sharing your story with all of us. And now I'd like to introduce our honored guests. Hillary Rodham Clinton, who really needs no introduction. She was our 67th Secretary of State and the first female presidential nominee from a major political party. But if there's one constant above others in her life, it's her steadfast advocacy on behalf of children. The title of her book, It Takes a Village, has become part of our contemporary lexicon. What perhaps is more oppressive is that among professionals who care for children, particularly children at risk or in need, the idea, the notion that it takes a village is now not only just uncontroversial, it's downright scientific. In 2009, Dr. Harold Koplowitz founded the Child Mind Institute, an independent national nonprofit dedicated to changing how we think about and how we treat children's mental health. In the last eight years, the Child Mind Institute has provided care to thousands of families across the country and the world, given out more than $4 million in financial aid, brought traumatic stress treatment and behavior management into hundreds of our schools, and reach tens of millions online with trusted information. The Institute has accelerated the science of mental health with a landmark study of 10,000 kids with the goal of finding biological markers that will revolutionize diagnosis and treatment. So I've known Dr. Koplowitz since I did a series of reports on children with ADHD for ABC News in the 90s. We reconnected when I was writing a book called Talking to Kids in Tough Times about the impact of the news of the day, the news of the world after 9-11. And then today, as the dean of a college at a big university, where we face a mental health crisis of epidemic proportions, I remain deeply vested in the mental health of children and adolescents. So as a result, I'm delighted to be here. And I am clearly proof that you never really leave Dr. Koplowitz's orbit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with that, let me introduce Secretary Clinton and Dr. Harold Koplowitz. Welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Nice to have you. So I shared a little bit of, of my um, being in your orbit, but you too, Secretary Clinton, you have known Dr. Uh, Koplowitz for nearly 20 years. Um, Probably since a you little were more. Yes. Really? Yeah. Since you were First Lady? Yep. And you brought Dr. Koplowitz to the White House in the aftermath of 9-11 when you were a senator from New York, and he came to you for help in getting services to traumatized children. We've come a long way since then. Can you give us a sense 
through your eyes of just how far we've come at prioritizing children's mental health issues since then? Well, Willow, first um, let me start by uh, really applauding uh, the Child Mind Institute and thanking everybody who's a part of it, everybody who's a part of the staff and the support system and the board and everyone who understands the vital importance of this um, organization and the work it does. And you're right, I met Harold more than 20 years ago. Um, uh, he and I uh, began to talk about health care when we were uh, attempting to change health care and provide better services uh, for everyone, but particularly for children, which was my priority. And the children's health insurance uh, plan, which we passed with bipartisan support at the end of the 90s, which now provides health care for 9 million kids, which, by the way, has not been reauthorized by this Congress. And by the end of the year, kids will start losing their health care. And so Harold and I shared a uh, common interest in trying to get better access to high quality, affordable mental health care for kids to deal with and try to diminish, hopefully someday eliminate the stigma, to support more and better research, because I think it's still the case that even today, uh, only about 5% of the National Institute of Health budget is allocated to the National Institutes of Mental Health. Right. Uh, so we certainly have improved people's awareness we have learned a lot more, and Harold is the expert on this, about how best to treat uh, children and adolescents. You just heard from this extraordinary young woman, um, Alex. Uh, there she is. Thank you for <laughs> being here and speaking out, because you are not only doing so much to demonstrate uh, your own personal growth, but helping other people. So thank you for that. Um, so I think on... Um, several grounds we've made progress. You know, we passed a law about uh, parity between uh, physical and mental health. It is nowhere near being uh, implemented the way it should be, but at least we got it on the books. Um, hopefully it stays there. Uh, but we're not, you know, we're not funding, we're not speaking out, we're not doing enough to try to continue the progress to give people uh, the tools they need in their homes, their communities, um, across our country, to both recognize and deal with uh, mental health challenges. So I guess it's a good news, bad news story. And this new report has a lot of good news in it because it does point in the direction of what can be done and what more should be done by combining treatments and raising awareness. But I think that um, anybody who is concerned about this, as we all are, who are here today, knows we have to do a lot more. So I'm, I'm the more optimistic, you know. <laughs> I think that, uh, but I think anyone who starts a not-for-profit in 2008 has to be <laughs> right. very optimistic. <laughs> uh, or, or, or maybe, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's, let me. So I think that the world's of psychiatry, and particularly child psychiatry, is being transformed by science. Mm -hmm. I think the idea that we know so much more about the brain in the last 25 years has changed, has changed television. You know, people think neuroscience is cool. They think we can, you know, figure out who the murderer is with neuroscience. But more importantly, we can now tell the difference between the brain of an atypical child versus a typical child. And in the next 10 years, I think we're going to be able to tell the difference between one atypical and another atypical. So the way to think about that is that if the three of us are coughing, we don't all have pneumonia. And with a simple blood test, we can tell that one of us... <laughs> One of, us has, one of us has pneumonia. That's what one, I thought, right? <laughs> one of us has a virus and one of us has an allergy. But can you imagine if we're all fidgety or inattentive, we don't all have ADHD. And if we can get to the point where through brain scans, through EEGs, through a, a, a complete comprehensive database of the developing brain, we'll be able to tell the difference between one child with one disorder versus another. And I think an objective test will also have a tremendous effect on stigma.
And I think there we're making progress too. If you would have told me 25 years ago that the royals of Great Britain would be talking about it, that Prince Harry and that you know, Prince, of, uh, Prince William and the Duchess of Cambridge, I would tell you it's, it's hard to believe that they're saying it's real, it's common, it's treatable. And that's the same with Emma Stone and Jesse Eisenberg and a whole bunch of heroes that we identified this past May. And I think the last thing is, is that we have some better treatments. And those treatments don't seem to be coming from medications. The, the new medications in the last 25 years have been very, there's been very little in mental health. But whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectical behavioral therapy or parent, parent management, these are evidence-based psychosocial uh, <laughs> interventions that work. But we still have a lot to do. I mean, we, we can talk about the barriers there. But I think we still have, we have a lot to be hopeful for. So I'd like to spend um, a good chunk of time unpacking your new report, which focuses on the state of adolescent mental health. Can you, though, just situate adolescent brain development in the continuum of the phases, the most important and critical phases of brain development starting in early childhood? Sure, so we know that the brain changes over time. There's a reason why we know that at three years old, you're going to have uh, 10,000 words, and at two, year, two years or 1,000 words, and two years old, you're gonna have 100 words. That at five, you're gonna be able to sit long enough to be in kindergarten and maybe wait your turn. But we also know that dramatic things happen to the teenage brain. That at 13, there's almost a revolution. We start pruning uh, the brain and get rid of parts of the brain that we don't use. It's kind of use it or lose it. And that exciting time between 13 and about 24 is something we're learning more and more about. And so it's easier to learn. It's, it's a good, you still can get a foreign language. You can still learn to ride a bicycle. There's a whole bunch of things you can still do that uh, become harder and harder when you get older. And the one thing we also know is that it's also a good time to get bad habits. Mm -hmm. uh, because the brain is very plastic. It, it's easy to learn things, but it's also easy to get um, dependence. It's easy to get addicted to drugs. And at 24, you start getting your prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain that's in the front of the brain starts communicating to the rest of the brain. So you start learning about strategy and cost and, uh, cost and risk. You put on a helmet, you're more likely to put on a seat belt. And Hertz will let you rent a car at 25. Yeah, so, so, somehow you know, somehow you know, the car companies they knew, knew about this before, <laughs> before the scientists did. Right. 20, 25 being 25. kind of the and, and we should warn mothers of boys that <laughs> boys are slower. <laughs> and it can sometimes be 27. And if you have a psychiatric disorder like ADHD, um, it could even be later than that. Which means that you know the impulsivity and the aggressiveness of the brain of an adolescent can not only be great for uh, you know, exploring new things, it can also be very dangerous. So the things that we see anecdotally in teenage years, that heightened, you know, it matters so much, that heightened state is actually tied to very specific functions, developmental functions in the brain. Absolutely. In fact, we know that there are centers of the brain between 13 and 24 where emotion is, is more highlighted. So when your teenager says to you, uh, I'm freezing or I'm boiling, they really are freezing or and I'm boiling, or, or I hate this, or you know, I can't believe how terrible this is, saying to them, ah, oh, it's not so terrible, doesn't really identify the problem. You should recognize they really um, believe that emotion because they're feeling it. So what are the major risks of adolescence? So the onset of 50% uh, of all psychiatric disorders occurs before the age of 14 and 75% before the age of 24. And so we also know that suicide uh, between the ages of 13 and 24 are not only the suicide completers, uh, around 5,000 kids every single year in the United States will complete suicide, 600,000 will make a serious enough attempt mm -hmm. that they will actually land up in an emergency room. So if we know that there's this contagious quality, we have to be, we have to recognize what else is going on in the world. So we talked about this briefly in uh, TV programs like 13 Reasons Why, which glorify suicide, which basically tell you that you know, the dead girl lives on. She has power in the classroom. She's glorified. People feel sorry. People want to tell her things. Um, really takes a terrible toll on certain teenagers who are thinking about suicide. And therefore, that media can actually have a very negative effect on a group of teenagers.
So um, one of the uh, alarming statistics that emerged from your report is that suicide is now the leading cause of death worldwide for girls 15 to 19. Why are girls at greater risk? So there's actually difference, gender differences in the brain, and that we know that sex hormones are actually uh, higher uh, during adolescence, and those centers of the brain may be the uh, difference that we see in mood disorders, anxiety disorders, once a, uh, a girl becomes, uh, hits puberty. And we also know that um, the incidence rate increases around the time that school starts. Yeah. So what does that tell you or tell us about what we may need to do differently at school? Right. Mm. Well, well <laughs> I, I think we have to do things differently everywhere, and school is one of those. And, you know, I, I, in listening to Harold and reading the report, I really think just a key to this is making sure that information is more readily available to people who interact with kids. Parents, family members, Alex's story about her mom, which was so incredibly moving. You know, people have to understand this because this may have always been the case, Harold. I don't know. You, you have the probably historical data. But it just appears to me that at least the evidence of anxiety and depression and other kinds of you know, mental health challenges are much greater today than they were. And I, I'd love for you to talk about social media, but to Willow's question, you know, schools have so much, we dump so much on schools to do mm -hmm. all the time. And we expect teachers and counselors and everybody to um, be experts in everything having to do with, with kids. And indeed, there is just such a gap between maybe what their knowledge is about the very things you were just talking about, uh, brain development uh, being at the center of it, and their, and their confidence that they can do anything about it. And what are the best interventions? How do you try to help an individual child? How do you try to set um, a better environment for the classroom, for the whole school? You know, what is it that you know, schools in particular can do? So I think that we historically have seen schools take up um, health education in remarkable ways in the last 30 some odd years. So when I went to school, uh, sex ed was taught by a gym teacher and you never knew he was talking about sex. You know, it was somehow, it was a, some kind of you know, video or uh, some kind of film. And after the AIDS epidemic, it is truly amazing how parents wanted schools to take charge of talking about this virus, talking about how you can catch it, talking about how you can be safe from it, what do you have to do, and kids learned about that. They, and we just talked about how terrific it is to learn between 13 and 24. So middle school and high school is a great time to get information. And I actually believe that mental health curriculums should be standard in every middle school and high school. So if you want to destigmatize something, you want someone to know, oh, you know, it turns out anxiety disorders are the most common illnesses of childhood and adolescence. Let me understand the difference between just being anxious and having a disorder. And the more facts kids get, the more understanding about their brain development, I think there's a possibility that you can start talking about the bad things that can happen to your brain. So marijuana can be very, very bad for a teenage brain. You are more likely to become dependent uh, if you become a regular marijuana smoker during adolescence than if you start smoking marijuana after the age of 24. I, that doesn't necessarily stop people from doing it, but knowledge about this, understanding how you have to take care of your body, and kids are exercising more, um, they should learn how to take care of their brain. Can you walk us through this issue of anxiety? You mentioned, and, and Secretary Clinton, you asked, are, is the most common mental health disorder in the United States affecting nearly one-third of both adolescents and adults? Are we seeing the rise of anxiety disorders? And if, and if we are, why? So uh, I would think that, number one, we're getting better at identification. Um, and therefore, we, whenever you identify something, you're going to see an increase. But, but let's talk about what anxiety disorders yeah. are. So 
It's normal to be anxious at the right time. In fact, our brain lights up. If something dangerous happened here, if someone came in with a gun or someone started yelling, you have, your amygdala jumps up and says basically fight or flight, you know, run away or beat that guy up. That's a normal response for your brain, and it's healthy. You know, you're walking down a street, you hear some noise, you get your body, your brains alert you, be alert, something's going on. When someone has an anxiety disorder, they have a false fire alarm. Their alarm is going off, and there's nothing to be uh, worried about, and they can't calm it down. Now, that can really interfere with functioning. You'll stop going to school. You'll, you won't talk in front of other people. You can't stop washing your hands, even though you know washing them once is enough. And that interference and that endurance, that if it lasts for more than two weeks, that's what makes it a disorder. What triggers it, Harold? So, uh, From uh, crossing the line between sort of ordinary garden variety anxiety to the disorder. So it turns out that anxiety is 35% genetic. That doesn't sound like very much. But there's also something called assortative mating. Anxious people find anxious people to marry. <laughs> and so, uh, 80, <laughs> when I read this study when I was, when uh -oh. I read this study when I was in residency, I said, oh, nonsense. But it's, you know, <laughs> think about it. It's, so for a lot of kids, it's 70%. That every time their mom and dad make a baby, there's a 70% chance they're gonna have anxiety. So I think the way to think about it is the genes load the pistol and the environment triggers it. And there are things in our environment that are making people who would have low level of anxiety have an anxiety disorder. So, you know, it, just watch television now. There seems to be one episode after another of terrifying things going on, that you go to church and people could shoot you. You go on the street and someone is shooting you. You know, you go to Las Vegas and someone's shooting you. Um, that, you know, you go for a, a walk in New York City and someone takes a car and tries to hit you. For the average person, it is amazing how we block that out and say, oh, statistically, that's not gonna happen. Of course, I'm going back to Las Vegas or I'm going to church on Sunday. Um, but for the person who's genetically loaded and has that minor, you know, sub-anxiety, that kind of event, even though it was 1,000 miles away or 2,000 miles away, triggers it off. So they might say to their mom, I'm not going to school tomorrow. I, it's just not safe. I don't wanna do it. And what about social media? So social media, I think, is great and awful at the same time. So we know that uh, the internet has been terrific for marginalized groups, for kids who've been feeling very lonely. They can find others who are experiencing the same thing they have. And yet, at the same time, we know that kids who watch, uh, teenagers who, uh, who are doing uh, social media more than 10 hours a week um, in eighth grade report that 56% of them say they're not as happy as their peer group. So it can be toxic. The other thing that I think we have to be very concerned about is the fact that there is material on the internet that is toxic. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've heard of, of teenagers who get radicalized by dead people who have videos still on, online and that they can self-radicalize themselves from that. So for certain individuals, particularly teenagers, where they have more aggressivity, they're more impulsive, they're more detached, they're more disenfranchised, the power of the internet can be really quite toxic. So for a teenager, and I, and I particularly boys in, yes. in the case of radicalization, something about the teenage brain makes you more vulnerable Right. When so, exposed so, to so, the so, same stimuli. So, so Willow, your mom's in the audience, so I can say this and check with her. When you were a kid and you, say, and you did something, you said, well, I want to do this because everyone else is doing this. Your mother would say, what, if they jump off the bridge, will you jump <laughs> off the bridge also? And the truth of the matter is there's lots of teenagers who will jump off the bridge if their friend does it. There is a contagious quality to wanting to belong. In fact, there are centers of the brain when you're around 15, 16 years old that make you more self-conscious. And that if you're with people who are doing bad things or doing something that you might not want to do, you're more likely to do it when you're in that group. And so the internet can play that role so that you already feel uncomfortable, you feel isolated, and yet by following this group, we find people who will do irrational, stupid things like jumping off a bridge, so to speak, but um, feeling the need to belong. And, and, and that may, means that we may have to think about, I mean, YouTube just scrubbed um, yep. a, a whole bunch of uh, videos. We must have to think about what the role of parents are in moderating and monitoring what our kids are watching and what the effect is. Right. Can so, I ask you, Harold, is, is there any way the internet could become more helpful in sort of interrupting these cycles of uh, 
needing to belong or getting anxious. I mean, could there be uh, a much more concerted effort on social media to try to put messages out there for teenagers so that at least there would be some warnings and some you know, breaks that might be available? Right. So if you, think about, if you think about something as simple as Netflix and 13 Reasons Why, if you would put in the middle of that program the equivalent of commercials, you know, these interrupters that say, if you're feeling really uncomfortable now, please get your parent, please call this number, please text here, that becomes somewhat more socially responsible. But the internet is responsible for certain things. So for instance, movements like It Gets Better, um, which was started by Dan Savage, you know, about gay kids, that they had higher rates of suicide attempts, that it gets better if you can hold out, if you can know that you're not alone. Uh, the, the campaign we did, hashtag my younger self, has had a really positive effect on kids who watch famous people talk about their mental health disorders. But I think that this takes a much more sophisticated approach to think about how we reach boys in particular who feel disenfranchised, feel isolated, and how we make them feel like they belong. I mean, I'm the child of immigrants. My parents were the most you know, patriotic. They never missed an election. Um, I'm super proud of being an American. And yet we have a group of new immigrants who, um, not always new immigrants, but boys, always boys, under the age of 26, who somehow feel that this country doesn't have the opportunity for them, or they are at the short end of the stick. And how we can engage them in a protective way is really something I think we as a nation have to give a high priority to. Because it's not like the devil's outside. The, the person who can get contaminated by this is already living here. So given what we are beginning to learn and beginning to understand, not just about social media, but about the power of technology and technology design, that we know that um, this technology, for all its good, is affecting human psychology in ways that we did not anticipate. Is there a role for policymakers <coughs> to play here in uh, uh, regulating, offering <coughs> guardrails mm -hmm. um, to tech companies um, who really uh, fulfill a unique role uh, in, in our culture, in our global culture today, um, that was not in existence even just a decade ago. Absolutely right, Willow. Yes, I, I think there is. And this is an opportune time because there's a lot of um, questioning and even soul searching going on about uh, technology, uh, clearly, you know, what happened in the election raises it, but it's much broader than that. And it's a, uh, it's a discussion that we need to have uh, because I, I really think there can be and should be guardrails. You know, taking down those videos of, uh, you know, uh, Al Awlaki, the former um, cleric who was still radicalizing people years after his death. You know, these are the kinds of things that there should be both you know, self-regulatory uh, discipline and outside um, pressure. And, you know, back in the 90s, we were really concerned about video games, remember? Uh, and the role that video games played in, you know, really desensitizing kids, again, predominantly young men, uh, to violence. And it's not that uh, we changed the whole industry, but by talking about it so much, by raising some of the uh, warning signals, by having conferences about it, you know, more and more people became aware. And also, I think, and again, Harold knows so much about this, but I think it also gave even gamers the idea like, okay, I know this isn't real, as opposed to just being so dragged in and made a part of this fantasy world where you know, you win by, you know, killing, you know, hundreds of people. So I think with respect to social media, there has to be greater vigilance, and not only from the government, but from parents groups, organized uh, efforts by mental health groups to keep beating uh, back this idea that somehow uh, it, it's both good, it's both bad, and all goes out in the wash, because if people are vulnerable, it's mostly bad. Right. And because we don't know exactly who is most vulnerable, and we can help parents and teachers and others you know, try to recognize uh, symptoms, but we, we may not have enough understanding to intervene unless we do put those guardrails up. And if you think about it, historically, we've done that. 
uh, the whole issue of pornography. Right. Um, you know, you had to be a certain age. You know, I'm going to show how old I am to get a, a subscription to Playboy. And uh, you couldn't go into a, a drugstore and buy one unless you were a certain age. Today, because of the internet, children are exposed to material that is really, in my opinion, um, difficult for them to understand, overly stimulating, um, unrealistic, and, uh, and sometimes very addictive. And so therefore, you know, helping parents know what kind of safety blocks they should put on the internet, what kind of discussions, how much time your kid should actually be on a screen every single day. And that's not easy, you know, I'm not suggesting it's easy. But we historically have done that. We know that not everything is for a child. You know, you, you can't go to a movie if it was X-rated or NR or, you know, there were certain things that would stop you. And I think the internet is, needs to understand that also. And it's clear, uh, at least I believe that it's clear from the evidence that it's heavy users um, whose risk goes up uh, for mental health issues, challenges goes up exponentially. Correct. Correct. So I think you, everything, the good news about adolescence is great time to learn, right? Great time to absorb things. If you think about fashion, you know, when I was a kid, I remember that I made my father listen to a Beatles song. And uh, I remember his, his Eastern European, you know, Holocaust survivor, significantly older than the other dads, listening to I Want to Hold Your Hand. And he was trying so hard not to grimace and that, you know, 30 <laughs> some odd years later, um, my oldest son was a DJ in the time they would scratch records. And I thought, this is worse than <laughs> I want to hold your hand. And, and I tried not to grimace, right? So adolescents always push the envelope. You, the fashion, the, the whole music scene, everything that we see on billboards is not of people our age, but of people who are young and who are willing to push the envelope. And that's something we don't want to get rid of. But simultaneously, we know that this is a risky period. That literally, um, the, uh, you upgrade three times dependency if you start smoking marijuana. You are less likely to be able to stop smoking cigarettes if you start at 14 um, and start smoking on a daily basis. That benzodiazepines, valium-like drugs, you can increase almost two times your dependency. So being a parent of a teenager is very challenging, and being a teacher of teenagers is very challenging. But that doesn't mean that we can't provide people with more tools and more knowledge. I, I think of, you know, this is a country that uh, tackled polio that when I was a kid, they threw you in the back of a station wagon with six other kids rocking around. <laughs> and you know, you get into a taxi cab in New York, and if the cab driver doesn't tell you, you know, the, they, the sign comes up saying, put your seatbelt on. And we tackled AIDS. It seems to me that if these are the most common illnesses of childhood, literally one out of five American children up to the age of 18 will have a, a diagnosable mental health disorder. That's more than asthma, peanut allergy, cancer, diabetes, combined, then this is a, a national health problem that needs to be tackled with, with lots of different things. But one of them is more information for the teenagers themselves, for the parent, and for the teacher. Harold, could you say something about how interventions and treatments work? Right. Because I do think that's not widely understood. And too many people perhaps believe that uh, there's, there's really no reason for them to express their uh, their feelings because nobody's going to listen and nobody's going to be able to help. So I, th I mentioned there's this great news with these evidence-based treatments. Mm -hmm. So there are studies that can show you that in depression, anxiety, and in ADHD, short-term treatments, treatments that are around 12 weeks of a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy along with a medication, 81% of the individuals with an anxiety disorder get better. 71% of kids with, a dep with depression get better, and 68% of kids with ADHD get better. Now, there's no other set of illnesses that has that kind of treatment rate. Now, there's a problem. Um, kids are afraid to go, they're stigmatized, there's lack of access, and very often um, it's hard to keep a teenager engaged and saying to them, we can do this. It's not you who's sick, you have an illness. It's not that you're crazy, it's this illness. But when you can get a kid to stick to the treatment, 
These results are extraordinary. And again, I don't think most people recognize how effective mental health uh, interventions are. And what do, you, what do we know about getting kids to stick to treatment? Yeah, it's a, it, so it turns out there's some tricks to it, but it's not great. 50% of the kids who start drop out very quickly. Um, it is, uh, there are actually techniques like motivational speaker type interventions where they engage with the therapist who basically says, I'm your partner, we're going to fight this together, seems to be the best way to go. Uh, a passive approach doesn't seem to work. You know, the, the classical thing we think of, of, you know, you go to the doctor, you lie on the couch, he's quiet, you're quiet. Uh, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't really work, um, and particularly for a teenager who's not really enthusiastic about being there. But you find that, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you that when someone comes back to see me, and I've been doing this a long enough time, um, that someone came back to see me 25 years later. They were 32 years old, and they walked into the room, and they said, you know, the best line, they said, Dr. Coppins, you haven't changed at all. So I said, well, <laughs> if that's true, then you need an ophthalmologist, not a child psychiatrist. <laughs> but, but what he said that he remembered when, I was, when he was seven was that I was on his side that I told the truth when I said the teacher was too tough on him, that you know, while he didn't want to take medicine for his ADHD, he knew that it wasn't that he was being punished. And I think that when a therapist is capable of saying to a kid, we can get through this, it is really a time-limited approach that's very effective. And nothing makes a kid feel better than relief of his symptoms. It's really, you know, left untreated, depression, anxiety, kids start self-medicating. And they use the worst medicines. They use marijuana, they use alcohol, which we just said was terrible for their brains. So significant success with treatment. But, you know, through, I will tell you, through the lens of a, a university administrator, we can't treat our way out of this process right now, this problem right now. We're overwhelmed. And we're, we have with, a shortage of people. With also. the need for counselors. So, and, and frankly, our folks are asking, what can we do in terms of prevention? So what do we know about the adolescent popula population and what messages will resonate with them before we get to a crisis point. But, and could I just add to what Willow said, because of her, her experience at, at USC, but Every college administrator that I know across the country is just so uh, worried about the increase in students suffering anxiety, depression primarily, and the overload on their, um, their meager health facilities right. and their inadequacy of being able to treat it. Is there some more population-wide effort? You know, take sort of general population and then take the college population because you know, I know that a lot of administrators are really struggling with the best approach here on a, on a broad base. So I think the good news about colleges facing this is that more kids are going to college today who have a diagnosis and have a treatment. Mm -hmm. So that didn't happen in the past. And also, if you went to college and you got sick, you went home and you didn't come back. You know, they wrapped you up and you sent you home. And today, colleges are taking on the responsibility. In fact, it was Larry Summers, when he was president of Harvard, who actually said the fastest growing um, uh, uh, budget was the mental health budget at Harvard because he was pleased to say he was taking kids from all over the country who traditionally wouldn't have been able to travel that far because of their mental health. So I think. There's a few things. Number one, I think colleges have a responsibility to know who their patient population is. So once you get into school, once you're accepted, I think not only should you hand in your physical exam, but you should do a checklist so you know at least which of the kids or what percentage of the children might need, students might need more help. I think uh, student bodies need to have um, real ca campaigns. So the number one thing college students don't do and is very dangerous not to do is sleep. And we know that if you are an adolescent and you sleep less than seven hours, you are more at risk if you already have that risk for psychiatric illness to start becoming symptomatic. And we don't talk about it. And certainly we don't sell it at school by saying, you know, sleep is sexy, sleep is necessary, sleep is, you know, because we just take it for granted that college age students don't sleep. Well, but also to your point of how important it is to start these conversations in junior high school, in middle school. Right. Those are the kind of conversations we should be having with our 13-year-olds. Co correct. You know, so first of all, I think every family in America should have at least 20 minutes a day without screens. 
perfect. You know, it's, it's kind of like you, you go to a restaurant and I sit down and I, it, it takes all my self-control not to get up and shout at a family where the father is doing this and the mother's got earpiece and the kids are watching movies on, while they, like, why are you sitting together, do you know? Yep. But everyone should have at least 20 minutes and in those 20 minutes, you should have a guided conversation. Parents should talk to their kids about what they did that day, what went well, what was challenging, and so that everyone knows that there's that 20 minutes. But also, you should talk about the, the difficult things that, you know, why sleep is important, why, look, exercise. There's a lot, while we have an obesity problem, there are a group of young people today in their 20s who exercise as though it's part of their life. They do it on a daily basis, which you don't see that many 60-year-olds and 50-year-olds doing. So you can change the way kids behave, but it's really important that parents deliver the message. I think also you should know that while those centers of the brain at 15 make you more susceptible to your peer group, mm -hmm. throughout your entire adolescence, your parents are still the most influential people in your life. There is no doubt that what your mom and dad say on a regular basis really affects you. And the important part about that is most parents pull back. They say, you know, but everyone's doing it. And if you have a strong belief in whether or not it's going to church or something about premarital sex or about substance use, you have to keep that conversation going. And if you don't have that 20 minutes, if you don't say dinner, breakfast, sometime we're going to be talking about it, the other voices that the kid listens to, whether it's in person or on the internet, become much more powerful and influential. Um, I th I'm looking at um, the questions from the audience, so thank you all for submitting them. I'm wondering if there are a lot of doctors in the audience, because some of the handwriting is very hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> so excuse me if I'm, I might hand them to you to see. If you, uh, um, but I, if, if it's okay with Please. you, um, there's one that's, that's relevant, um, and it's from Lori uh, Bernstein, who's a high school guidance counselor in a New York City public school. And she writes, so many people agree we should have a mental health curriculum, but how can we get the powers that be above the principle to value um, this with time and money? How can this even be part of the conversation when a teacher is evaluated? Well, I think this is one of those areas that um, has to be made a priority and groups outside of the education system uh, like the Child Mind Institute and so many others, uh, need to come forward with a curriculum uh, to the boards of education, uh, to the administrations of school districts, uh, and just lobby like crazy uh, to get those into teacher training, into uh, school programming. And I'm not saying it would be easy, and some parts of the country it will be harder than other parts, but if there could be some standardized approach. And I'm really looking at you, Harold, and your colleagues, because you can't expect educators to do it. And you don't want you know, some drug manufacturer who's basically just pushing the drug piece of the uh, treatment. You really want the experts, the professionals, uh, to come up with such a standardized approach. Then I think we would have a fighting chance. And you know, individual teachers like uh, this woman would have something to turn to and can say, well, there's a standardized approach that's been adopted by the American Psychiatric and Psychological and all these other groups, um, so let's get it into our schools. And I know here in New York, mental health is becoming a much bigger priority for uh, the de Blasio administration, so there might be an open door to push on, and then other places around the country uh, just need that kind of uh, attention and constant uh, uh, persuasion to get it uh, accepted and then implemented. And I think there's a, a way to piggyback this also on helping teachers with behavioral management. If you look, we're, we've been working with Teach for America, and Teach for America is terrific at teaching these really brilliant young teachers how to teach kids to read and to write, and many of them burn out because they can't manage the class. They feel incompetent and, and impotent when kids are so disruptive, and when you teach them skills on behavioral management, um, they feel very grateful, they feel empowered. And I think simultaneously, if they could understand you know, behavior and then teach it would be not only exciting for science curriculums, it'd be exciting for healthcare. It could be something that just becomes part of the, the culture of the school. And is there something you could share, we've got the village sitting here, right. Um, about, for example, behavioral management that we could all take away. Right, so, so it, I wish I still, you know, my kids were younger so I could practice this, but, um, 
So I, I think it's very unique, something that we do at the Talman Institute, um, which is parent management training. So you have a child who's very uh, oppositional and defiant between the ages of, let's say, three and seven. Um, the parents uh, don't want to use medication or the medication has too many side effects. And we try to teach the parents three things. We try to teach them, try to grab a positive behavior. And when the child has positive behavior with an earpiece in the ear, we tell the mother, Praise the child very specifically. Thank you so much for spending the day with us, this hour with us. I know how busy you are. You're so attentive. You're so intelligent. I really think it's wonderful. We don't say that to our children. And so we grab that. And then this is the hardest part for parents. You actively ignore insignificant off-task behavior. So your child is talking with their mouth full. They didn't put the napkin on their lap. Uh, basically, you're, you find yourself always giving negative stuff instead of you know, ignoring that. And then how to intervene when your child does something really quite awful, kicks you, curses at you, throws something. And when teachers understand this, they start spending a lot of time complimenting kids who are sitting quietly ready to learn. Or the kid who raises their hand and say, thank you for raising your hand, Willow. I'm not going to call on you, but I really appreciate that you raised your hand. And changing that, it seems silly, but if parents on a regular basis actually paid attention to positive behavior and labeled it specifically, it really it, it puts money in the bank so that when you do have to say something negative, the kid can actually hear it and process it pro properly. Sounds like that might work for adult to adult. <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it, might, it might also be good for marriages. You know? <laughs> um, if I may go to another um, audience uh, question. Um, let's see. This is, this is a bit of a, uh, can we address mental health issues without better addressing racism? And this comes from Jeff Ginsburg, East Harlem tutorial program. He situates that into um, context by saying that the opioid crisis is being discussed in very different terms than the crack ep epidemic of the past. Mm -hmm. Students of color with emotional lives seem to be suspended at much higher rates than white children. Therefore, can we address mental health issues without addressing difference or racism? Right. Um, you know, the, the sad part about uh, child mental health disorders is that they're equal opportunity disorders, rich or poor, black, brown, or white, or yellow. We're all, we all get hit with the same percentages. What's really troubling, though, is the rates of treatment. So um, kids in poverty, kids of color, um, not only because of a lack of access, but because of more stigma related to these disorders and a lack of awareness in the many communities, are less likely to get help. And if you have a psychiatric disorder, something as simple as ADHD, you are significantly more likely to uh, have academic failure, and you're more likely to drop out of school. And if you're in a poor neighborhood or you're a kid of color, you're much more likely to get involved with the juvenile justice system. And once you get involved with the juvenile justice system, uh, bad things really happen. And so now, when we look at the juvenile justice system, 70.4% of the children who are in juvenile justice meet criteria for a psychiatric disorder. So we have taken a bad juvenile justice system and made it into a terrible mental health system. So we, we have a big problem in this nation about getting care for everyone, but in particular, care for kids of poverty. I think, though, um, there, there are assumptions that go hand in hand with the way kids who do act out do have you know, disciplinary uh, problems in school are treated. Because clearly, the numbers are staggering uh, that black boys, followed by black girls, are much more likely to be suspended or expelled or punished or put into special ed. Uh, for behaviors that are at root mental health problems. And the comparisons you know, demonstrate that uh, it's at a much higher rate than it is for white kids. Some parts of the country that includes uh, brown and Latino uh, kids as well. So the, the assumptions that this is a, a child with a disorder or this is just a disorderly child uh, stand behind so much of how we treat kids. And so much of the uh, the, the point you were making about parent management, you know, years ago I, I studied a lot of work about, you know, how you build children's vocabularies. And, you know, 
It's one of the reasons why I do a lot of the, the pushing of reading, talking, singing to your kids. But for a lot of low income, highly stressed families, um, the verbal interactions are predominantly negative. Right. Don't do this, don't go there, you're gonna get in trouble, you stop that. And it's not out of malice, it's out of a sense of trying to protect and in the, in the best way you know how to sort of guide and discipline your child. But with that constant negative messaging and with the assumptions that you know, kids often unfortunately are tagged with when they go into schools, you know, the problem uh, becomes greater because what could be a mental health problem does, as Harold say, said, you know, evolve into a, a criminal justice problem and then young people are really lost right. because, you know, we deinstitutionalized people back in the 70s, right? right? With the promise that we were going to have more community um, facilities and care-based treatment, which of course we never came up with to the extent that was needed. So now jails and prisons are basically our mental health holding facilities without adequate treatment and that's particularly tragic for kids. I'm gonna um, ask you one last question. Okay. I know we just have a minute left. We're gonna get some free advice from Dr. Coppola right now. <laughs> um, in, the, in the form of this question from um, Belinda Lescombe from Time. Um, this is right off the news. What should parents say to kids who are watching the stories, both boys and girls, kids boy, um, about sexual harassment? Right. So I, you know, I think you can solve that in about ninety seconds. Sure, right? sure. Perfect. <laughs> That's what I thought. So I, you know, I, I think that there are teachable moments, um, and that parents, the number one thing I would always tell parents is not ignore what's going on in the news. Don't think your kid's not hearing about it, even if they're young children uh, versus teenagers. Because if you don't talk to them about it, all somebody, about it, somebody else is talking to them about it. And it always comes out worse when someone else is talking to them about it. So I think that it's a matter of having a discussion, particularly with a teenager, about um, a, the facts of what's going on, but more importantly, behavior. And that this is the moment, I think, where parents should talk to their daughters and their sons about what is appropriate and what it means to ask for permission and what it means for someone to deny you permission and respecting somebody else's as a person, but also respecting their body, their rights, their space, and have a discussion with them. Because I think the first part before you give them your opinion is to hear their opinion. And their opinion might be something you'll find very objectionable. And that's okay as long as you can carry it out and discuss it and then share with them what you think is the right kind of behavior. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, this is something. This is not going away. This is this is actually, in my opinion, one of the best things that's happening in society in the respect that it's a watershed moment where women, for uh, women and some men, it seems, have been kept in the dark uh, and sh and shame instead of being able to speak about this. And I think this is the kind of thing that could change our culture. But if if you don't have parents talking about it and discussing it and giving validating it, I think it's a lost opportunity. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for sharing this hour with us. Um, if you'd like more resources on uh, youth mental health, you can go to Harold's website, um, childmind.org. And thank you, of course, to Secretary Clinton for being so generous with your time and, frankly, for your legacy of putting children and families first. So really appreciate it. seats um, so that we can let Secretary Clinton and Dr. Oplowitz.